What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the roll up. Today's episode is with Rob and John from ZK Verify. This one was really fun. We talked more about ZK proofs and ZK verification on Horizon's ZK Verify. We also talked about proof aggregation and specialized verification with ZK Verify's purpose built chain or ZK verification. At the end, we talked about the road to mainnet, so stay tuned for that. Before we get into it, a quick word from our sponsors. Welcome aboard on our journey into the singularity. This is the end game roadmap for Frax and Fraxtal, the new L2 out of the Frax ecosystem that is totally based on Fractal scaling. Fraxtal is a modular L2 blockchain built by Frax with modular and Fractal scaling in mind. Fractal scaling is based on the Mandelbrot set of Fractal images and it explains how L2s become L3s and the entire app chain life cycle goes through its evolution. The Frax ecosystem is made of some of the top builders in the space and has stemmed from its OG days of the Frax stablecoin. It is now in the LST space, the LRT space, and this Fraxtal L2 joins the existing suite of Frax products including Frax Swap and Frax Lend. You can see Frax Ferry, the bridge to go from any chain, Arbitrum, Optimism, or Mainnet into the Fraxtal Mainnet. Bridge your tokens and bring your Frax assets into the Fraxtal ecosystem. Join today to get the best out of Fraxtal. You are still early. Join today. Take part in our expedition into the singularity. Cartesi is your home for app-specific rollups. At the forefront of developing new tools and platforms that enhance the capabilities of blockchain technology, Cartesi enables applications that are flexible and built to scale. Build on a full Linux environment and use traditional software libraries, but in blockchain development. Go to Cartesi.io, that's Cartesi.io, to learn more about building your own app chain today. What is going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Roll Up. Today, I am stoked to welcome our friends Rob and John from ZK Verify to the podcast for another exciting conversation on ZK. We're going to be going deep on both verification as well as all things ZK. Um, yeah, without further ado, I mean, uh, Rob, John, welcome to the podcast. Uh, you guys want to go ahead, introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll get a little bit more technical and into ZK. Sure, I'll, I'll just jump in because Robbie, we we share the best names out there, so uh, I, I think we should take precedent there. Uh, I'm Rob Viglione. I'm the you know co-founder and CEO of Horizon Labs, and uh, it, it's our company that's kind of seeding the, the initial technology into zk Verify. So we're just really proud of the legacy that we have within the you know, that segment of the industry and Web three more broadly. Uh, real quick background on me: so I, I was started my career as a uh, scientist originally, physicist, mathematician with the U.S. Air Force. I was in what's today uh, called the Space Force, but back then it was just uh, Air Force Space Command. Uh, and then got into more operational intelligence type stuff. Um, t t took a break there once I got into Bitcoin because Bitcoin's amazing. And I think uh, was was a game changer and something that I just kind of jumped on as like, this is going to change our world. So it, it gave me the opportunity to kind of break from that career, go back to school, and I got my PhD in finance. I just loved uh, you know, that switch from hard science into social science and economics was just really cool and I think uh, very relevant for building you know, crypto ecosystems. Um, so, so that's my story in a nutshell and then excited to get into ZK Verify. Awesome, welcome to the show. John, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hey everybody, I'm John Camardo. I lead the product team here at Horizon Labs. Uh, I started my career in commercial banking uh, about 10 years ago, actually, 
I uh, worked in a variety of areas of, of a pretty big commercial bank, mostly in data analytics and uh, and product management. Uh, about three years ago, I joined Horizon Labs uh, as a product manager and uh, kind of been working, you know, in that capacity ever since. Uh, really excited to be here to talk about ZK Verify, which is the project that I'm kind of spending uh, the bulk, if not all my time on. Uh, so really happy, happy to be here and excited to get into it. Awesome. Yeah, welcome both guys. Um, that's, uh, that's really exciting that you guys are now building ZK Verify. I think uh, our audience has enough background to understand ZK in a nutshell is kind of two sides. It's proof generation and then proof verification. Um, and the idea of, of ZK proofs is that uh, they might be somewhat complex to generate, but once you generate them, they're very easy to verify. And so when I first approached this concept, I found it somewhat perplexing almost that you, there would be an, an entire project, if you will, totally based on verification, because in my, in, from my understanding, ZK proofs were like this succinct thing that was supposed to be easy to verify. Um, you know, why looking at ZK proofs, what are some common misconceptions? And then, you know, why is it that we need something like ZK Verify to exist in the market? I'll just jump in and say, I think that every new technology follows a very similar kind of a mature, like a adoption curve in a source off with everything being generalized. It's kind of like new technologies are one stack. And in our stack, I think Robbie, you summarize it very well, where you have this kind of expensive and complex proof generation and then much more simplified and uh, lower cost verification. But the reality is that holds for certain volumes. And as soon as the technology itself starts getting enough traction and adoption, what we're seeing now and what we started seeing as of last year basically was the cost of verification on chain started to explode because of adoption. And, and ZK itself is a phenomenal technology and, and like our, our um, you know team at Horizon Labs was the core team behind the third ZK project that was out there called Zencash uh, back in 2017 when we launched. And the state of technology back then was very rudimentary. I mean, we used Snarks and like the first implementation of Snarks on chain. And now the, the technology has just become much more complex, also much more useful. And you're seeing it integrated into many more interesting products, everything from rollups um, that have succinct you know, state proofs of entire execution layers to applications on chain even things like ZK IDs. So we started to notice basically as of last year, because we've been in the segment for years, is that the cost of verification was starting to finally become meaningful enough to get a company like ours to start paying attention to it. And then if we extrapolated that even further and said, okay, if this trend persists, and we don't think it's just gonna linearly persist, we think that ZK is gonna hit this kind of adoption point in the curve where it goes exponential. And, and even it goes beyond Web3 and you see, you know like SQL databases using ZK proofs to all types of Web2 applications as well, having a common, trusted, secure verification layer for all of this stuff just makes a ton of sense. So that's why we started to get really interested in it. I think the only couple of things I'll add, I agree everything with everything that Rob said. Um, but I, I mean, like the, so on the, on the proof generation cost, absolutely expensive, but we all have to sort of recognize that that's on the hardware side and that proof generation is typically done off chain. When we're talking about ZK applications, like some of the ones that Rob mentioned, like rollups, they need the verification to be done on chain. And while the verification could be done off chain in a very inexpensive way and very, very quickly, mm -hmm. it does obviously consume resources of whatever blockchain it's being verified on. And when you like have these proofs that are being generated, you know, at relatively high frequencies or what could be relatively high frequencies in the future, um, they're all going to be competing for block space and on Ethereum, for example, that block space is, is already being pushed to its limits or has been pushed to its limits in the past, which therefore has contributed to some pretty, you know, astronomical costs for, for certain types of proofs to be verified on chain. Um, so I guess that's the one just like little distinction that, that I would make there is that, you know, yeah, it, it is very cheap to verify these proofs, but when you're talking about doing that in an environment where there's competition for resources, um, you know, it, it could turn into a, a very significant cost. Um, and so that's sort of why we've decided to build a blockchain that's entirely dedicated to verifying proofs. So we cut out all the other sorts of things like DeFi transactions and whatever else is happening on Ethereum or frankly, any other blockchain. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the only thing I'd add there. 
Makes sense. Yeah, and that that way you guys are able to avoid this noisy neighbor problem where if there's a, a really popular NFT mint or some DeFi, you know, fluctuation and there's some volatility in the market, gas prices go crazy because everyone's trying to push transactions through. And then hence it makes it very expensive to verify some proofs. Um, but if you push that into a different chain, almost like an app chain for verifications, you guys are able to avoid kind of like all of those noisy neighbors that are generating uh, transactions and just isolate your transaction environment to your own chain. So actually, um, a point that I, I started before but didn't properly complete was, uh, you know, this kind of arc of um, you know, technology development is ultimately gets to the point of specialization. And probably to your point of this noisy neighbor problem, it's all about specialization. I think that this is where the industry is going to go, is you're going to see specialists in certain segments of the value chain. And within ZK, that value chain can be defined as kind of proof generation, proof verification in its simplest terms. And now we're specializing in the verification component of it so that we have, like from a product perspective, one, like we, do, we reduce costs and that's awesome to get an order or two magnitude reduction in costs, but it's also about stability of costs so that the volatility of pricing just gets normalized. So from a product perspective, you don't have to worry about, you know, like some massive NFT mint or some other congestion that we can't foresee today. This is going to hit Ethereum next month, right? Uh, so, so that's part of it. But then also, because we're specializing now, it um, collapses or removes the constraints that you have on what types of elliptic curves can you actually use on Ethereum today? And right, this whole thing, this idea of this like, you know, lopsided barbell of proof generation being super expensive and the verification being cheap is because of the elliptic curves that were chosen because we knew the constraints of Ethereum. We knew the constraints of a public blockchain, but because we have a specialized you know, like optimized chain ZK Verify, we can actually stay ahead of the Ethereum dev curve and offer different types of cryptography that product um, developers can actually choose and still operate on Ethereum, verify with us, and you can use completely different cryptography. Rob, I'd love to dig into some of the, like the elliptic curve cryptography. Mm -hmm. it, it is something that I hear a lot about. And I tend to think it's really <laughs> fundamental to, to the, both the economics and generally the coordination of how everything happens in a secure way on Ethereum. Um, and it's also kind of an intersection of both the hard science and soft science that you mentioned earlier. And so I'm curious, like, could you just expand further on, on like how these elliptic curves were chosen, why they were chosen, and what the differences in those curves mean for the economics of this system? Yeah, I, I mean, so just the, at the highest level, and then John, please feel free to chime in because he's actually directing our product roadmap for which ones we wanna add next. Um, but even even Vitalik now talks about different types of uh, cryptography that would be interesting, like Binyas, as an example, that you just can't do on Ethereum today. And the way that it works is the curves that are chosen were those that are heavy on the computation because that can be done off chain. And then on the verification side, you have to be light because to have a solidity based smart contract actually running that computation for every single node, every every block that's, that's generated is super expensive. So you want to choose a curve that has the verification super, super cheap. Um, and, and, and not just that, but then pre-compiles are actually done and added to Ethereum selectively on certain uh, kind of like uh, primitives that would help your operations as a product developer. But what we can do, because we can just jump to uh, like adding a new palette to like our, our ZK Verify as an example, and we can add a palette, say like on a monthly cadence, we can just keep on staying ahead of that Ethereum dev curve so that we know that at some point, like as an example, take Binyas. Right now, Binyas can operate on Ethereum, but and we're probably not going <laughs> to integrate it in the very near term on ZK Verify either for certain like technical reasons. But just take it as an example, uh, we could um, integrate that in ZK Verify well in advance of any precompiles that would take years to actually uh, get approved and integrated into Ethereum. And product developers could use that with us today, right? Versus waiting the years that it would take for those precompiles to exist on Ethereum. It's just an example, it, and that's just how we look at it. Is we're sort of like an advanced incubator for Ethereum and then other chains like, and, and talk about Bitcoin. You can't do proof verification on Bitcoin today. And I know with Opcat, you have groups like Starkware talking about adding like a, a Stark verifier natively you know, onto Bitcoin. That's probably a long time away. And even if they do, it's kind of like one thing at a time and probably super expensive to actually do the verification computationally on a chain like Bitcoin. 
But if you offload that onto a specialized chain, you can actually still operate with the same types of cryptography or, or with the types of cryptography that you want or need for your product based on form and function, and then still settle onto your L1 of choice. And I guess just to just to chime in there on a couple of points. So I, I guess like going taking a step back, one of the things I, I constantly ask myself, I'm challenging this assumption that Rob brought up earlier, which I fully believe in, but I, I continuously yeah. challenge it in my head, which is, you know, do we actually like really expect to see this like proof generation and proof verification volume sort of explode in the future? And I, I constantly come back to this like it, it feels like a very like chicken and egg problem, right? Like if Ethereum made it super efficient to verify proofs, would there be a lot more proofs that were being verified on Ethereum? And I believe that that's true, uh, which is kind of why we're sort of building this ZK verify thing to begin with. Um, but if you kind of think about like what has to happen to have a proof verified on Ethereum, there are some uh, uh, groups that have sort of like built you know verifiers for Ethereum, but in reality, what they're sort of doing in the background is they're taking a proof that's been generated in one type and converting it to a Groth 16 proof for one of these simpler type proof types that that Rob mentioned. And those still like at Ethereum gas costs today kind of cost around six or seven dollars. So if you think that like, for example, I think ZK ID was brought up earlier. How many times a day do I log in and need to verify my credentials for any particular app? Probably at least three, four or five times a day. Um, should it really cost $30 for me to, you know, log into Google or whatever? Uh, so we're really trying to like sort of tackle that and, and by enabling these different proof types to be verified on chain, we're really sort of, uh, doing a couple of things. One, we're trying to, we're going to help, you know, drive down the actual proof generation costs. Cause there certainly are more efficient ways to generate these proofs. And if they don't have to be converted from one type to another before landing on chain, like that's a huge cost reduction on its own. Um, but then we're enabling, you know, sort of different types of crypto cryptography where both the generation and the verification side, can, the timing to actually create and then verify these proofs can be super, super low. And so we can hopefully, you know, enable a bunch more use cases that probably don't really, are, aren't really feasible today, or at least aren't feasible on chain. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you take this step back because I do want to dig into some of the OP cat stuff um, and like what that means for the economics of ZK proof verification as well as for Bitcoin. But but John, to your to your point there, I think, you know, when you say uh, you don't want to convert them, you're, you're kind of alluding to this idea of the general purpose risk five ZK VMs, right? And how uh, that those ZK VMs make uh, these proofs in Rust, which is a generally more familiar language for developers. And so you're saying that we can circumvent that. I'm, I'm curious as to how, because we see risk zero, we see a bunch of these ZK VMs start to pop up. And so what is kind of like this alternative path that, that you described where we can actually keep the proofs in the more, in their kind of like native tongue, if you will, the more complex one, uh, without them having to go through some sort of transply, you know, transpilation process. Yeah. So this kind of goes just like to the general, like, I guess, life cycle of a transaction within the ZK verify space, which is kind of the way that we're imagining. Uh, so I can kind of walk through that, but uh, I guess just to take a step back, yeah, that's exactly what I was alluding to. And and just to to plug what we've done so far, we recently launched a risk zero verifier. So anything that's generated with the risk zero with the risk zero proof um, can be verified directly on zk verify. And so now if we take the step back, I think the w way that works in Ethereum today is you you run your uh, sort of computation through the risk zero VM, uh, the proof gets spit out, but it gets converted to Groth 16 and then verified directly on Ethereum. What we're sort of envisioning for ZK Verify is that instead of, you know, having to go through that process of converting the proof before it lands back on Ethereum, we just ask, you know, the prover that's created the proof to send the proof directly to ZK Verify. Uh, after a couple of blocks or after a number of proofs are verified on ZK Verify, we're sort of posting a bunch of data in a really consolidated way back onto Ethereum or whatever other whatever other host chain uh, might be, you know, hosting the application that's generated these proofs. Um, and then the application that needs to know that those are verified, they may be optimistically assuming they're verified. 
Um, if so, they can continue and check later. If they need to see the verification, they can look up that, that data structure and very efficiently find uh, the verification uh, confirmation in, in that data structure. Got it. Okay. Okay. And kind of bring that full circle to the to the general assumption that you, you kind of brought up that still seems like it holds true, but, you know, want to remain skeptical is that uh, this cold start problem of, of uh, ZK proofs at scale, you know, significant volumes of ZK proofs flowing through blockchain. And this is something that I've, I've kind of tangled with as well, because, you know, we see how everything right now runs on cloud compute um, through these centralized companies. And so I, I've kind of brought this question up. I've got some mixed answers and I'm curious what you guys think. And I think a lot of this ends up being an, uh, an incentives question because arguably uh, it would make more, it would be more secure to have a ZK proof verification system running on like, like verifiable computation rather than cloud computation. But for, to get that verification, you know, we have to like co corroborate across all these different nodes. They have to gossip to one another and we have to do this like replication process to verify what, what, you know, what the other nodes in this network are doing. And so do you think that we'll ever have verifiable compute at par or more affordable at, at more at greater scale than cloud compute? At greater scale and more affordable. Uh, John, why don't you, as the product guy, talk about that one. Uh, yes. but I, I, and like I, I will say, um, just I think sometimes it's uh, it's not like a, a binary outcome of like all this or that. It's kind of like a segmentation thing. So like what type of compute would segment in a way that is valuable to be uh, verifiable versus what type of compute is perfectly acceptable to do in the cloud space is the way that I would look at it. And then, so like rather than kind of hoping that what we're doing now in the value chain for ZK can ultimately lead us to cheaper verifiable compute than what's available in the cloud, I would look at it as, okay, assume that it's more expensive, but what segment of the market would that be valuable for, right? But John, right, I don't that, know how you feel about it. Yeah. One that wants more secure compute, but is okay with paying a, a little bit of a premium for exactly. that security. It, that, that's how I look at it. And that's how I would forecast the coming, you know, near term, like in terms of years. Um, but I, I don't know, John, if, you, if you're more optimistic, I, even that to me is an optimistic story and super cool. I guess just a question, uh, like, isn't that sort of like what blockchains are, 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 I mean, we're building a blockchain, right, to verify proofs, but it's not just like one node that's verifying the proof, it's mm -hmm. the entire network that we're asking to, you know, ensure, ensure you're paying like a premium there, right, because it is being distributed across an entire network, but isn't that kind of like what this is aimed to do? Yeah, I, I think a fun, more fundamental question to ask is like, how important is decentralization? Yes. You, you have okay. Solana which is just trying to max out, you know, the, the scale of its single machine. And then you have Ethereum, which is a much more decentralized machine and trying to scale off of the L1 and have this roll up centric roadmap, obviously decentralization being way more important for Ethereum than Solana, but both have users, both have arguably have like product market fit, you know, th that's very relative, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, you're right. That is a valid question to ask. Like, you know, what is, what are we really doing here um, on chain? Yeah, but I think it's a, it's a segmentation thing though. Cause like you said, Robbie, there, there's a perfectly valid market for the Solana world and a perfectly valid market for the Ethereum world and a perfectly valid market for the Bitcoin world, right? Like there, there's kind of form and function for all of them. And that's why like, as a fun example, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi. I probably stopped being a Bitcoin maxi in like 2013, right? So it's like, there there is absolutely room for a form function product market fit for different segments of, of value. Yeah. So, so getting back to the Bitcoin, you know, kind of like the improvements that are, that are happening there. Um, you, you know, you guys have been in the space for a long time. Bitcoin has remained stagnant for a long time. And now there's some like resurgence of building and, and uh, innovation that's happening there. Um, I heard from a little quantum cat that expects OP cat to be online like this year. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty aggressive timeline. Uh, Cause I, I realized that it, it's kind of, it seems like it should be years away, but might, might be much closer. And so I'm curious, how does, you know, how does like, just from the basics, how does having a stark verifier on Bitcoin work versus having something like ZK Verify that verifies in a different place aside from the Bitcoin L1? Uh, 
maybe it's, it's best for me to start more general. <laughs> yes, John, John can go into more of the tech, but uh, the way that I look at it is, um, so you will have a very specific type of proof that will be verifiable with a start verifier on, on Bitcoin. Uh, now there will be computation involved there and the ability to write a verifier into, you know, in, into the chain using opcat that nodes can choose to run uh, is great. And it, it is, uh, I, I would call it a tech breakthrough for sure, but it's for a very specific type of proof. Uh, what I look at what we're doing is uh, offering kind of a generalized attestation mechanism, attestation of verifications that you know, links in with ZK Verify so that basically ZK Verify you can think of as like a one-stop uh, source for verification, any type of like proof type, you know, from any type of source, Web2, Web3, doesn't matter. It could be Groth16, could be Boojum, could be, you know, FLOC, whatever. Right. And you can run your, your computation in whatever proof system you want, verify with ZK Verify, and then have a generalized attestation mechanism on Bitcoin that that proof can, that verification can be uh, settled onto Bitcoin. Whereas, it, and it's done in a way that is super computationally efficient because it's literally just writing data on chain, uh, kind of like inscription style um, versus actually performing the computation on, on Bitcoin with the, kind of the, the Stark embedded verifier. Now, they each, again, like getting back to like segmentation and form and function for what I think really matters. And this is where like, we, we always question, well, why are we doing this? Is it just cool technology or is it actually serving a purpose on the market? Well, uh, you know, for um, plenty of different use cases and for plenty of different types of proof systems, you probably just want to write that data on chain and you probably don't need to actually do the verifiable computation on chain. For certain types of high value use cases that use a specific type of proof system with Starks, cool, use the verifier. Mm -hmm. But I would bet, and again, like I, I want to be optimistic on it because I think the team is absolutely brilliant that's doing it, but still just the way that it works, it's going to be an expensive form of computation. Right. And just imagine like every miner having to do an expensive form of computation that automatically segments the type of problem that you can solve with that. You're not going to be you know, doing the whole buying a coffee type of problem with Bitcoin, you know, using a stark proof that you're settling on, on Bitcoin clearly. But that's not why it's being designed anyway. Right. It'll probably be working for different types of like, um, you know, L2s that are going to operate. Uh, but anyway, so it's just kind of like a, a product form function thing. And we're like the generalists that are super cheap. Um, the way that we're trying to do it versus the specialists that have a much more expensive, but again, high value operation. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add there is just like, I think um, certainly, you know, computation is going to be needed, going to be needed to be done on chain there. Uh, I would also just question like, like to Rob's point about, you know, which market is this serving? Like it's serving a market that doesn't need, you know, high throughput, like super fast execution. Uh, whereas, you know, we're building a chain that is meant to do this proof verification, you know, within a block. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, six seconds versus minutes uh, and the six seconds number is is potentially going to go down. But, uh, you know, we can, you know, take in many more proofs, verify them much faster than I think they'll be able to be done on, on Bitcoin, at least if my understanding of the, the whole situation there is is correct. Covalent is solving the long-term data availability problem where a lot of the data availability providers today in the modular space, when you post data to them, they actually only hold that data for about 12 to 16 days. And then it's basically, they can go into an archive node or oftentimes it's just kind of put away into the abyss. And what Covalent's trying to do is build this long-term data availability solution, which can plug into some of these modular data availability providers and provide this longer term perpetual data solution. So what we try to think of this as is when you post transaction data onto Celestio or Veil or any of these modular DA solutions or even Ethereum, Covalent is able to provide a long-term data storage and data availability platform for that data after the time period. Blockchains are billboards, not databases. And you know we need these providers in the space to be able to kind of hold on to the long-term data that is provided from these providers and these blockchain state. This is where Covalent comes in. They just had a nice rebrand. Check them out on Twitter as well as the website. Thank you for being here. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Mantle is a layer two blockchain with one of the biggest on-chain treasuries in all of crypto. And they had a hundred day campaign called Metamorphosis Live Now. What this is, is it, it is a campaign for their liquid staked ETH token and ETH as well as their upcoming liquid resaking token, CMETH, where you can 
utilize this token on the Mantle network in a variety of different apps, some of your favorite restaking protocols and DeFi protocols, and earn yields in the form of powder, which will eventually be turning into a, a governance token. Mantle's been around for a while. We like them because they use their own form of Eigen DA. Uh, they have a good ecosystem and they're growing. So check out this 100-day Metamorphosis campaign and hope you guys enjoy the rest of this video. Yeah, one, once again, kind of like a, the segmentation, you know, I, I, I think that's a great framing for this. Um, you know, something like uh, clearing between reserve banks, right? If we get more El Salvador's online, uh, and they're shipping money, they're shipping Bitcoin back and forth, right? We may want that computation to be done entirely on chain, depending on which balances are moving. Um, something like a gaming application on a Bitcoin L2 that just wants to like post the end state back to the L1. Uh, that is a good, better use case uh, for something like ZK Verify that is going to have quicker uh, proof times, uh, cheaper proof times, uh, and then handle the, the computation off chain, but then post the end result uh, back to the L1. And, and gaming, I think, is is a pretty good example because you guys have an integration that recently came online uh, with ApeChain. Um, and so we'd love to hear more about that, how that's going, and generally like what the process was like kind of building that out and working with an NFT community like the apes. Yeah, John, if you want to so, dive in on that one, please. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can provide a little bit of uh, an, an idea of what's going on there. So essentially, um, you know, when we originally built the proof of concept for ZK Verify, we were imagining a very different world than, you know, we realize exists today. Uh, so we were, we were very like roll-up focused, roll-up centric, like we wanted to verify proofs from ZK roll-ups. And therefore, we built out this attestation thing that we've been talking about uh, that post data directly back to Ethereum. Since then, we've sort of, you know, looked at the market, we've heard from potential customers and realized, you know, there's a whole world of potential other types of ZK generating, ZK proof generating applications like games, to your point. And so uh, we've been working with uh, the Ape, ApeCoin community for I guess the better part of two, almost three years now, um, ape chains obviously being built. So we said, Hey, there's a big group of, you know, gaming centric developers that likely will exist on ape chain. Let's start posting our data back to, uh, the ape chain test net right now. And ultimately when it goes live mainnet. Uh, so essentially, you know, we wrote a contract, the contract lives on ape chain. Now it lives on Ethereum as well. And, um, horizons Eon, which is an EVM compatible blockchain. And quite simply, you know, any proof that's being submitted to um, CK Verify, the verification of that, the confirmation of the verification is being posted to ApeChain with the hope that, you know, any type of, of game developer there could potentially utilize this for something like, uh, there's there's a really interesting card shuffling algorithm that involves zero knowledge proofs. And so I can imagine, you know, not only like casino type games like blackjack or poker, but, you know, even, you know, uh, Magic the Gathering or Pokemon, like collector card games where you're playing against somebody and you need confirmation, you know, that their cards are shuffled, that they have a full deck, all that kind of thing. So we're hoping to sort of spur some, I guess, innovation in that space uh, and hopefully, you know, verify a lot of proofs that come from from these types of applications and and obviously many others as well. That one hits home. I uh, I got started in the space playing playing poker with Bitcoin. So yeah, that that one's uh, that one's pretty cool. Um, Sweet. That that makes a lot of sense, um, both uh, with with respect to the gaming uh, developers on Ape Chain and kind of like how you're going to uh, verify the proofs uh, on onto Ape Chain. And so, you know, as as this sort of uh, continues down the line, like you know, you guys are trying to 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 push scale. Um, I think you know we see more and more of these chains popping up. It's not just Ethereum. You know, you guys are on on ape chain and and horizon and theoretically down the line more and more chains and so one of the things that we've heard a lot about you know i i mentioned that kind of before we started recording we recently spoke to brendan and uma from succinct and, and ag layer and ag layer is doing you know exactly what it sounds like they're doing proof aggregation right and so they're trying to do that with network effects and kind of build like this not just very easy interoperability across these different chains, but potential network effects in the form of shared liquidity um, and cross roll-up transactions. And so just starting very broadly here, I'm curious what your take on this proof aggregation concept is 
Um, and then we can get into like what the implications of that down the line for user experience are. I'll just start by saying, I think it's awesome. And, and we know those guys and it, it was a great podcast that you did with them. Um, so I, I think that it's an absolutely necessary and needed part of this, the value chain of ZK. So it's really cool that they're uh, leading that. Uh, I would say it's different than what we're doing in the sense that, so they're going for pure cryptographic aggregation, which is phenomenal where, when you have a homogenous kind of ecosystem that you can aggregate across, um, but there's trade-offs in that. And the trade-offs are, well, it's still computationally costly and it takes time. And sometimes aggregation can take hours before you finally settle on chain. Uh, but again, for segmentation, you know, for certain form and function use cases, that's perfectly fine. And they're going to drop the, they're going to amortize the cost of transactions by orders of magnitude by doing it, but it'll still be limited. It'll be expensive. It'll be slower, um, clearly, but for the use cases, it's absolutely uh, a great option. What we're doing is, is sort of like a, what I call like heterogeneous aggregation. And I don't know if the team like hates me for using this term, but um, I, I call it heterogeneous aggregation in the sense that we're verifying across many different types of proof systems. And then we're aggregating those, but we're not cryptographically aggregating. You can view it as a form of social consensus. It's the blockchain that's aggregating them per block and then having this condensed kind of Merkle tree where the root gets stored onto your, your L1 of choice. Um, so it's just, again, different trade-offs. This is kind of near real time in, in the sense of block cycles versus kind of like waiting hours for aggregation. And it's computationally super cheap to do, right? And it's one that we can add a new verifier literally as like a substrate palette Every, not, I mean, we, we do it in like sprint cycles, like two week sprint cycles, but say like a month, we can add a new proof system. Uh, you can't do that. You can't add a new aggregation, you know, like proof system in, in a month. It, it'll take a long time to do that development work. And, you know, it probably won't be uh, feasible for many different types of proof systems, right? So that's the way that I look at it. I think that what they're doing is absolutely great. Uh, we we um, are very supportive of their efforts, but we're just in a different segment of the market. Totally. Yeah, and you know, you you mentioned uh, the zk uh, proof. Uh, uh, I forget exactly how you mentioned it, but like the the supply chain essentially, the zk proof supply chain. Um, heard you mentioned a couple times. So just kind of broadly, could you explain that supply chain and just kind of work through that? I think at high level, you know, we all kind of get get the general idea, but yeah, what does the zk proof supply chain look like in practice? Well, I mean, the way that I look at it is uh, it starts by uh, having a need for some sort of proof, right? Some some sort of uh, computation that's done that warrants a proof, and then you have uh, some some hardware that's running software that generates the proof, right? So you can think proof generation. Then there's kind of a supply chain within proof generation. You've got proof generation networks now, like Prover Network is an example. Uh, and then you've got the hardware on the backside of that trying to accelerate proofs and make them GPU optimized and so forth. Uh, and then you've got, you know, things that, uh, you know, kind of the intermediary step, like what you're seeing Aglayer doing, what you have projects like Never doing, which are actually aggregating proofs, you know, to try to, okay, well, these things are super expensive. Let's just jam them all together and amortize costs down. And then you've got uh, all the way down on the value chain, the verification side. And verification historically has just always been like a smart contract on Ethereum, you know, some sort of verifier in a web browser, depending on the proof type, right? And now what we're doing is we're offering just specialization at that layer, right? And then, yeah, it opens up completely different trade-offs. And like the way that you have to look at this kind of value chain is it's all about trade-offs. It's about what are you trying to do? And ultimately, what is that problem you're trying to solve that this type of cryptography or, you know, uh, technology is, is suitable to solving? Awesome. Um... John, anything to add there on kind of like the economics of the ZK proof supply chain? Um, not a ton. I, I mean, I, I think I want to highlight maybe the point that Rob made, which is, you know, the, the sort of proof aggregation thing is very great for, you know, a number of things, right? Like the interoperability component, which I don't know if we've seen really in practice yet, but the promise of that is, is super uh, interesting. But again, like it, it, it involves these trade-offs that Rob's mentioned a number of times, which I fully agree with, right? Um, and it's just like a, I guess, like sort of a totally different market, uh, sort of focused on versus us, where we can, you know, essentially decrease the time to, I guess, hard finality, like on-chain finality, um, in the sense of, uh, you know, as soon as the proof is verified, we are essentially sending, you know, the confirmation back to whatever chain, which certainly opens up a number of use cases, like, you know, if an exchange needs the proof verification, you know, immediately you're on chain and 
therefore funds can be released to a user more quickly. Maybe we enable some of those use cases more than, you know, the interoperability side of things. Um, it's just a, a, a sort of conscious decision that we've made not to go down that path. Uh, but I think they are two different sort of segments of the market, probably with some overlap in the middle, but um, just sort of different market segmentation that we've done. You know, uh, one thing to say is like, I I, I envision a future, like a mixed, uh, a mixed set of solutions in the future where you can en envision a certain type of transaction that gets kind of, uh, you know, 80, 90% of its finality needs from ZK Verify, but still goes through an aggregation process, right? For kind of like deeper cryptographic proof, right? And c collapse and cost that way potentially, but because maybe a certain type of transaction might have a need for releasing funds or releasing an end game asset or, or something like that. Um, you would use ZK Verify, it, it's super cheap, it's fast, right? And then you would still send it through an aggregation process. Totally. Awesome. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it, and it kind of shows how you can get the best of both worlds through this segmentation. Um, and this, this is something that we're a big proponent of, uh, calling it modularity, where, you know, you guys are, are totally focused on your segment. Um, and then there's... Uh, uh, not entirely orthogonal, very similar, but... Um, but different proof aggregation service that these ag layers, uh, Nebra, those guys are doing uh, to crypto cryptographically aggregate these proofs and, and amortize the costs. Um, but what you guys are doing is able to take those proofs, uh, verify them, and then broadcast them back to the, the relevant L1 uh, so that everyone on that L1 is apprised of the latest state and the latest proofs and have a, has assurance that those proofs are verified. Um, as we kind of wrap up here, getting back to like some of our higher level philosophical questions about decentralization and whatnot. Hmm. Um, you know, I remember when I was first on Ethereum, um, it was 2016 and I just wanted to get some coins in my wallet. Cause that, like I said, I was playing poker with Bitcoin, but I knew that there was a lot of other exciting things out there. One of them was Ethereum, but at the time I had to download the entire blockchain in order to hold some coins. And so it was like they were forcing me to run a full node. And now, you know, a lot, so much of this is abstracted away. Like, you know, user experience would never have anything to do with that. And so I'm curious, like, how important is it to you guys that, you know, we have everyone not trusting the chain, but verifying the chain themselves? Um, we've seen light nodes come out, people running them on their refrigerators. You know, Celestia was a big proponent of this and light nodes. I think we'll have ZK light nodes sometime soon. Um, you know, when I think of a verification layer of sorts in ZK Verify, it's important to accelerate and scale the entire ZK proof process, but it doesn't remove the need for decentralization to verify at like the, the individual level for the assurance of what is going on in the chain. So I'm just curious, again, like at a philosophical level, how important is it do you guys think for everyone to be running full nodes and, and be verifying proofs themselves? Um, or is it is it sufficient to kind of have this like one verification layer um, that is then passing those verification and assurances back to the to the L1 and the root chain? I, I can maybe jump in here. I, I don't know if we've talked very much publicly about this, but um... I guess just taking like a major step back, like I didn't really give an intro on ZK Verify. The ZK Verify, you know, L1 blockchain, but uh, it's built using Substrate, which, uh, you know, is the technology stack sort of behind Polkadot, Kusama, and a number of other networks. Uh, and sort of one of the, the really uh, cool things about Substrate, uh, they have all these pallets that we can take and sort of like, you know, modularly compose into whatever we want. And we made a decision to implement uh, sort of nominated proof of stake consensus, which is a little bit different um, from, you know, delegated proof of stake or what you'll see in sort of the Ethereum space. Um, and the, the major difference is that, you know, it, it essentially is a consensus that allows for people with lower amounts of tokens that are being held to have a much, you know, bigger voice not only in the consensus, but also, you know, beyond that and gov governance and that kind of thing. And so to answer your question, I, I, I know it might've been a little bit of a meandering path to get there, but uh, we, we do, you know, want to promote like a high degree of decentralization. This will be, you know, a community project. Um, 
And so that was part of the reason that we chose this consensus. We wanted to make sure that, you know, even people with 100, 1,000, 10 tokens can actually nominate a validator. By nominating a validator, by the way, your stake that you're putting up with that validator is, uh, you know, potentially could be slashed if that validator misbehaves. So there's there's much more of a, a focus on you know not having these big whale type validator nodes, um, and it sort of like I don't know allows for the the little person the little uh, the little fish in the big pond to you know have a bigger voice, um, and we're going to try to keep you know the requirements for nodes down so that you know people can decide to run them without having to expend a ton of money uh, to do so. So I, I, I hope that answers your question with respect to the, the decentralization. We're not imagining that you'll be able to run a node off your phone, um, but we are you know, trying to incentivize everyone to be involved with this. Uh, and sort of through this nominated proof of stake, we're, we're able to achieve that. Can I just weigh in here is uh, on the philosophical side of it is I, I think decentralization for us is super important. Um, and, and it's super important for us specifically because the the function that we're performing with ZK Verify is literally ver verifying computation across Web3 and maybe Web2 and stuff. So the, the integrity of that, that verification is absolutely critical and therefore decentralization is abnormally or much more important for us than it would be, say, for like Solana users. Uh, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so, so that's the way we're, we're approaching it. Uh, and we're going to put a lot of effort into our infrastructure. And like John said, the choices that we're making on the technical and the governance side of things are all weighted very heavily towards decentralization. Perfect. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I think the nominated proof of stake is something that um, is very cool. We don't see a ton of projects doing that. And so, John, just you know, another word about the nominated proof of, of stake. How, how is it that... You know, I, I think the proof of stake is pretty self-explanatory. Like you put up stake, it gets slashed if you misbehave. In the in the context of a ZK proof verification, if the verification, you know, you say that it's true, but really it's false, you get slashed or vice versa. You know, that that's a, a case of misbehavior. What is it, you know, how, how does the stake and the nomination work? How do, how do these uh, these nodes that are nominated, but maybe have some smaller stake and, and not as much that could get slashed? How do they have a bigger voice? Just because I'm, I'm not as familiar, I think our audience may not be as familiar with nominated proof of stake. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to simplify. I encourage everybody to the Polkadot, govern, the Polkadot consensus documentation is actually pretty good. And more or less, we're you know going to be um, taking a lot from there. But essentially, like starting from the very end, like there's a group of validators that are selected uh, to, to forge blocks. That group of validators ultimately were nominated, but once you get to this like last phase where there's the active set of validators who are actively going to be forging blocks for the next 600 or so blocks, the stake that you have doesn't actually matter. So it's more of like a randomized round robin kind of situation. Um, and then like before that, there's actually a bigger subset of validators that can actually become active. And that active set of uh, the, the non-active or like the pool of potential validators, those are all based on, you know, who is nominated and um, the nomination process sort of encourages you to spread your stake out as opposed to put it all like in one particular node. And you can sort of see very clearly like for particular nodes, like how, what's their uptime been? What have their offenses been? Like all this is very transparent. So I guess like I, I say that I say the fairness, I brought up the fairness point just because, you know, you're spreading out your stake across a bigger number of nodes. So you have a higher chance of ultimately getting into that, that end active validator set. And by doing that, you don't end up having, you know, one person with, you know, 20% of the, the total stake or 5% of the total stake of the network sort of running things. They're disincentivized from having one node with a ton of stake allocated to it. That should actually be spread out from a game theory, you know, optimization point of view to a lot of different nodes. So you end up with a with a situation where, you know, if I'm just nominating with ten tokens or whatever, I do still have a chance of, you know, being a like a, a part of a, an active validator with a, you know, I potentially share like quite a bit more than I would if I was nominating or delegating to somebody with, you know, a huge, huge, huge number of tokens where my percentage of the reward would be much less than it would be in this in this world, um, and that 
doesn't do you know the best service to nominate for a mistake. I do encourage everybody to take a look at it, but it but it is much fairer than than uh, the delegated proof of stake. Got it. And and what is you know is this process available? Let's say our community is listening. They want to get in there. They want to verify a proof uh, and become a validator in the network. Uh, is it possible for them to do that? How how would they go about uh, becoming a verifier in the, in uh, zk verify? So we we do have pretty extensive documentation on docs.zkverify.io uh, tells you all about how to set up a node, whether you want to run a boot node, a, va a validator node, or just, you know, an RPC node. Um, we don't have any like real incentives that are announced or, you know, around that right now for the, for the test that phase. Um, but, you know, if you choose to, you can, you can definitely do that. The requirements are very low right now, uh, but they'll likely change as we proceed. Uh, also on that documentation site, you can find ways to generate proofs um, with command line arguments and then submit them to the chain. Um, and it's pretty comprehensive in terms of, you know, going from not from writing the actual like computation that needs to be verified, but from generating like a toy proof and, and submitting it to the chain. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, the node. Um, the node setup is there as well, and, and we have some public uh, user interfaces where you can actually go in and, and nominate uh, particular validators if you want to go through the process of, of trying that out. That that piece is not fully implemented yet. It will be over the coming like month or so, um, but you can certainly you know play around with that and, and try it and, and see what your reward would, would theoretically be. Everclear is pioneering the clearing layer. The clearing layer can almost be thought of as splitwise when you go on a trip with friends, but for the blockchain. What I mean by that is when users are sending cross-chain messages, there's oftentimes fillers and solvers who have balances left on different chains that they need to rebalance and reset their positions. This is where Everclear comes in. Everclear is pioneering a collaborative approach to the chain abstraction future, and they are willing to work with interoperability partners, solvers, and other providers in the space to build a interoperable and chain abstraction future. Please check out Everclear at everclear.org and welcome back to the roll up. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, I, I think that sounds great. Uh, we might have some people in our community that are uh, eager to try that out um, on testnet. And uh, yeah, I guess my last question is like, uh, and feel free to take this, you know, uh, into some closing thoughts, but like, you know, what is the, Rob, you know, we can start with you. What is the path to mainnet um, and beyond? Uh, so path to mainnet, uh, it's funny. John's probably glaring at me because he's uh, <laughs> executing on the, the product plan here. But um, so we're, we're um, probably going to be code complete with what we want for mainnet as early as literally this month, July. Um, and it, it depends uh, on ultimately when we choose to green light a launch um, and there'll be a lot of other factors that go into that some of them out, outside of you know the project's control so uh, that's why we can't specify exact timelines but what we want to do in the interim though is kick off and incentivize testnet so that people can actually get out there start using the technology set up uh, your use cases you know Robbie maybe want to set up uh, you know some poker on Ape chain would be great. Uh, and start sending proofs to, to ZK Verify and then start earning, you know, what would ultimately be the, you know, the token that ends up launching for the network. Uh, this is really important. It's a critical phase for us as we solidify the tech. We learn a lot more about um, the product itself. When you think about the protocol as a product, we, we need to know how it's actually being used in practice so that we can modify things as needed to make it more user friendly. And, and, and that's why we would kick off that kind of incentivized test night. And then we're going to roll into a, a big launch. And, and then the launch, again, there's going to be a whole bunch of um, kind of launch uh, criteria. They would have to go for the community to do it. Ultimately, though, the thing to say is uh, like Horizon Labs is, is kind of seeding uh, some technology here, but ultimately it's a community project. And that's why we're getting out there like on, on this show, as an example, is just to, to help build that community to get it out there because ultimately the community is going to take this thing and, and run with it. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Incentivized test net. You guys know what that means. John. <laughs> um, yeah. And I'll just add, add a, a couple of things and, and uh, be a little vaguer in some cases, but a little more specific in other cases. So um, just to go back to the node conversation, I would actually encourage people 
you know, if they want to run a node, fine. But like the bigger thing that I would like to see people do is start to build applications that use ZK Verify for proof verification. That's a much higher value um, item for ZK Verify, and you can extrapolate from there where it might end up being more valuable for the community. Um, whether you know between if you're making a decision between running a node or submitting a proof, submitting a proof is much higher value for us, and and so we encourage people to do that. Are you being vague um, or specific, John? Uh, I'll be vague in other places. Don't worry. That was the more specific part. Um, in terms of the path to mainnet, I think from a from a proof verifier's point of view, we have pretty like extensive compatibility. We have Groth sixteen, Risk zero, and then we are able to verify proofs that come from Polygon CDK, which is ZK rollup, and um, zk sync era. We would like to add more verifiers, and we're in the process of adding one more right now. There will be more uh, as the year proceeds, and as we hopefully get you know requests from the community and and sort of feedback from potential customers on what proof types they'd like to see verified. Um, other than that, we're sort of like you know now working on preparing for this sort of mainnet launch. Uh, so we we are in the process of sort of implementing. Uh, tokenomics and, and governance pieces. And uh, so that should sort of evolve over the the re remainder of the year. Um, but I, I guess like all that to say on the verifier side, I think we're, we're pretty in a pretty good spot. We do want to add more and we encourage people's feedback on that. Uh, you know, if you have a proof type that is super fast and efficient, you can't, you know, generate that or verify it on another chain, let us know. We're more than happy to take a look and potentially implemented in just a couple of weeks. Um, but we are really sort of going now heads down on all of the stuff that actually makes a blockchain operate, right? Um, which is super critical and important for for the mainnet launch. So that's kind of like the state of the, mm -hmm. the state of ZK Verify as we see it today. Um, and I guess like the one last thing is if you have a chain that you want the attestations to go to, you're interested in building out a totally different chain, uh, the process for us to to kind of move uh, or send the confirmations to whatever chain you want is pretty straightforward. So happy to hear any any requests or, or feedback on that as well. Um, and we can certainly work with with anybody who's willing to uh, reach out and, and request that. So can can I add one other thing here to to uh, the the both um, vague and very uh, <laughs> very um, tailored uh, set of sequence of things is the Horizon community just ratified a proposal to actually migrate the entire stack on top of ZK Verify. So it, the specific thing there is because we're building ZK Verify as a, a substrate uh, chain, they could actually uh, implement Horizon as a pair chain on top of that and actually benefit from either pre-compiles that can be loaded in there or uh, a direct XCM bridge to ZK Verify itself. Why does that matter? It's because Horizon then actually can kick off a very targeted program for ZK applications. And then those ZK applications can just natively run with ZK Verify. Um, so on, on that EVM you know, parachain. So that's kind of a cool thing that I, I don't know how public we, or loud uh, the community's been about it, other than like there, there was this proposal that was ratified and now there's just like a ton of effort to get this thing as like kind of the first big uh, anchor user of ZK Verify is like a whole ecosystem building on top of the ZK Verify ecosystem. So that's something I think is uh, super bullish in the sense for usage because it's an EVM. It's an EVM that'll have these native uh, primitives that could be used for like uh, ZK applications. Awesome. Guys, thanks, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing uh, your knowledge about ZK uh, and talking us through Horizon as well as ZK Verify. Uh, both from a technical and non-technical lens. Re really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you.